I was a drug addict and Jay was homeless before we met. We talk about this a lot on the podcast, but we don't really dive deeper into our stories. So today we're going to ask each other questions that we've never asked before. And we're going to share them with you so that anytime anyone asks us anything about ourselves, I can just point them to this podcast. So our number one question we always get is, how did we meet? So I'm going to tell you that wonderful story. We have a mutual friend named RJ who was doing interviews with people on her YouTube channel. And I was fighting with my ex-husband and hate washing dishes when a notification came on that she had posted her interview with Jay. So I turned it on and he was yelling at the camera, oh, the past. And he got my attention right away. And honestly, I fell in love in that moment. And I stopped hate washing dishes and just stood in my kitchen and watched for 45 minutes as he talked about homelessness and uh, personal development and value and worth and all these amazing, wonderful perspectives that I honestly had never heard from any guru that I had been following for, for a few years before that. So I went to his Instagram and I stalked his Instagram. I read all 500 posts he had, every reply, comment, and caption that was there. And I fell further in love. So I couldn't, I wanted to sign up for his newsletter and I tried with five different emails and he couldn't sign up. For some weird reason. The universe. Well, so definitely the universe. The universe wanted us to collaborate. So I was like a day or two where I was really nervous and I went back and forth. And I even asked my ex-husband what I should do. And he said, well, don't be a piece of go talk to him. So I did. So thanks. I appreciate that. (laughs) And we became friends and we collaborated on our first project which was a book on I did a shitty job on my side, but he still fell in love. (laughs) And here we are. (laughs) So I'm going to ask the first question. A lot of people want to focus on how you got homeless or why you became homeless. And that doesn't really matter because it was a lack of income, mostly why it happened. So I'm going to sneak two questions in with my my one. (laughs) So Jay, what were the most positive parts of being homeless? And how did you come out of the homelessness? That's a great question. I've never had anyone ask me what are the positive parts about being homeless, but there's plenty. And one of the biggest ones is the freedom. Okay. Most people are born into a family and they're raised by that family and they're surrounded by peers and they're interacting with society and they're engaging with authority and so on. And so they don't really get to develop their own personality. They're just an amalgamation of all the connections around them because we're born connected. We live in a connected society. Connections are wonderful, but isolation and individual personal time is also very important. We basically don't have any of that. Even when people are alone in today's society, they're connected to their devices and they're connected to the internet and to other people and they're interacting with peers and so on. And even if they're alone in their bed, they're still going over in their mind their interactions with every social connection. How did that go with this person? How did that go with that person? I'd like this to go better, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) It's like, that is a lot of connection from day one. That's an overload of connection. Right. And people quickly learn to cater to those connections. Oh, I have to keep my family happy. I have to keep my teachers happy. I have to keep my job happy. I have to keep my boss happy. And you don't hear any of them talking about keeping myself happy. True. That's last on the list, not even important, not relevant. And so it's a massive blessing if you're somehow in an environment where you don't have to cater to anyone. And being homeless is the ultimate in that. It's pure freedom. You can stay up as long as you want, eat whatever you want, play whatever you want, do whatever you want, walk around, work hard, do whatever, interact with whoever you want, walk away from whoever you want. What are they going to do? Take your house away? Fair enough. What are they going to do? Snatch your support system away? You don't have any. (laughs) So screw it. You learn that you're your own person. You learn that you're an individual and you're allowed to be happy and you can prioritize your happiness first. There's no consequences anymore. You might as well. And so a lot of people dream, like dream of the day. Oh, when I'm finally free, my kids are gone and I can do what I want. My family is not obligating me and I can do what I want. 
I move to another country and no one can bother me and no one can hassle me. It's like, but you can do that in your own city. If you have guts, yeah. if you're a baller, if you can make the choices and put your happiness first, you might end up homeless, but that's not the end of the world. Lots of people have been homeless. Right. Lots of famous people you look up to have been homeless. Yeah. So people act like it's the end of the world. Society pretends that being homeless is worse than killing your dreams for your family or your boss or your teachers. That's pretty bold. And that's mighty controversial of you to say. And Well, that's what they do. You say, I want to do X, Y, Z. And they say, well, you can, but then you'll be homeless. Mm -hmm. And you say, I don't want to talk to these people or I want to choose my own family or I don't want to interact with these people. Mm -hmm. Well, you can, but then you don't get to live under my roof. Mm -hmm. It's held over everyone's head. It's waved in front of them like a, a, a stick to punish you with. Yeah. Or a, a carrot. They'll use the opposite side for a carrot. You get to stay here and live with me. It's like I've deliberately walked out of homes and shelters and chosen homelessness many times rather than tolerate bullshit from somebody I don't I don't want to tolerate. Right. I've walked out many times from people who have been disrespecting me or putting my happiness below where I want it to be. Well, I would assume, and I could be wrong, that probably people didn't think it mattered because you were homeless like oh well no like your happiness well i don't know what they thought i just could tell when someone was disrespecting me and i was like i will go elsewhere i don't need what you're offering i don't rely on you for shelter i don't rely on you for my happiness i don't rely on you and what you decide is right and what your situation is i can just leave and everyone has this option but very few people have the courage to take it they no, think they're scared they think they will die they will literally die if they try and live off their own resources or live without a support system or live without connections because they've been born into connections since they were a baby and it's all they know and it's super scary. But in old days and in primitive tribes, you were put out on a vision quest to be alone, to survive alone. You were taught that isolation is important and having individual personal time is important. You were taught to live off your own resources and stop relying on everybody and stop sucking on society's teeth all day long until you're 90 years old or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It used to be a normal thing, but it's not now. And people who are born in today's society literally have no clue what it's like to live unconnected or disconnected from everybody else's agenda. So yeah, that was one of the biggest blessings of being homeless was the freedom and the isolation and the me time and the ability to live how I want, when I want, and to figure out what's a priority for me and what's important to me and to start choosing the people I want to be around. Well, I think it's quite admirable and, and I love that you have such positive feelings and, and words to talk about homelessness, something that most people like would just die over the fact that th that's happened to them. If you read biographies, homelessness was a blessing for a lot of famous, successful people. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it worked for you. I mean, it was it was a good thing for you in the end. And I love your positivity. Always, always. Like I almost recommend it. It was hell on earth and I let it go for way too long. But, you know, some pretty big upsides. Right. I wonder, like to the person listening or watching, have you ever had something super traumatic like that and seen it in the same positive light? Because maybe not necessarily this the same light, but. Can you take those memories or those thoughts of whatever it was and make them positive like this? Because most people would say homelessness was the worst, horrible, no way. And actually, I feel the same about my drug addiction. Like, it's super positive. I'm so glad it happened to me. So I wonder, like, whoever is watching and listening can say the same about whatever, like, going on with them or in the past. Yeah, I mean, fingers crossed. And there was two other things, two other really positive things that were takeaways for me, which were one- it taught me to follow my heart and kind of tied into the last point. I don't think anyone is free to follow their heart until they've stood apart from all the constant connection. Mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to follow your heart mm -hmm. when you're constantly plugged into other people's agendas. Right, fair enough. So that was a very good thing to learn. I highly recommend learning it how to hear that inner voice and how to tune into your true priorities. And it's not going to happen in the noise of everyday society. It that happens when you're out in nature alone. It happens when you're out homeless or it happens when you're on a vision quest or whatever. That's mm -hmm. when it happens. If you can find me an example of someone who's like, I've totally discovered my heart by staying connected to the same peer group I've been growing up with. No. 
No. Yeah. You just can't. Right. But most people find out to follow their heart when they are going through a dark time or forced to be isolated or forced to be an individual or stand on their own. Yeah. These are the times where you find your true voice. And most people never do because most people avoid these experiences. So I can get way deeper into that. But the third thing that it taught me was that it's a blessing to ask for help. I thought asking for help was terrible, but asking for help was a blessing. And I didn't run around asking people for help while I was homeless. I was a very proud and dignified person. And uh, most people couldn't even tell I was homeless, even for the full two and a half years. But eventually I had to ask a few people for help and they were happy to help. And they felt blessed by the opportunity. People like to be of use. People like to feel valuable. People like to help others. If everyone took care of themselves perfectly, flawlessly, and never needed a thing from anyone else, they would all just be like marching towards death, never connecting with anyone and never needing anyone. And all the people around would feel useless. Like, yeah. I have no one to help. I have no one to serve. They, everyone would start to feel worthless and not valuable. It's true. So instead of feeling bad when you have to ask someone for help, as long as you're not running around abusing them and asking for help every two seconds, if you're really doing your best and you need help and you step up and ask for it, it's going to be a blessing to them. Yeah. Uh, so that was a big positive too. Yeah. So there you go. Those are the three. Oh, and you snuck in another question. How did I get out of it? That's a pretty long story. You wanted to take up the whole podcast episode? No. Okay. So start from where you were crying in the bathroom. Okay. So I just failed to kill myself and I was pretty much at rock bottom. I couldn't succeed in life. I couldn't succeed on the streets. I couldn't succeed in becoming unalive. And I found a closed down mall and I was wandering it and I managed to sneak into the bathroom before they locked it. And then either I chose to stay there or they locked me in when I was inside it. I must have chosen to stay there. Anyways, I was actually kind of grateful because it was a well-lit place with running water and shelter from the elements. So it was actually a step up. It was a luxury. It it beats sleeping on the grass, the dewy grass, the cold concrete or benches. It was indoors and relatively heated and so on. But as I lay there pondering my situation, the world's biggest failure with an IQ of 140 plus, I, uh, I ended up just crying, like crying and crying and crying, bawling my eyes out. I had snot pouring down my face, just covered in this stuff. It's pretty gross. Well, it was that like, you know, that dirty, messy cry where your soul is breaking. And when I woke up, I was like, screw it. I'm just going to lay on a park bench and dehydrate or starve or something because I'm done. I'm done trying. I'm done using my smarts and my talents. I'm done trying to solve this issue. I guess I'm destined to be homeless and then die. And once you accept the worst case scenario, it's very empowering. A lot of people don't do this. They fight and resist the worst case scenario. But to change the worst case scenario, it requires accepting the worst case scenario. And so when I accepted it, I ended up laying on the bench for 36 hours until the Toronto heat was boiling me. And I had like blisters on the back of my shoulder blades because I was laying against this unsanded wooden bench. And I was like, this is annoying. I guess I can't even lay here. I guess I have to move. So I went to the library and set up my laptop and I just started answering people on the internet who had business questions and branding questions and success questions and life questions and relationship questions. I was just giving away tons of answers and wisdom. People ate it up. They were loving it. This was back when internet forums were big. I mean, I posted a bit on, I don't know, Reddit or something here and there, but it was mainly these forums. And one of them was Evan Carmichael's forum. And I ended up taking over the moderator's jobs. Like I finished all the answers before they were even awake because I had nothing else to do. They had lives. (laughs) And my answers were so good that it ended the conversation. Like there was nothing else to be said. It was like, yeah, solid advice. Thank you, dude. That's fire. This is better than I could have read on any blog. And so the moderator put me in touch with Evan and then he saw value. He was like, I need to hire this homeless guy. And we ended up working together and collaborating and spent over a decade doing all sorts of stuff for Evan and and, uh, his empire. We grew him from 1,000 YouTube subscribers to 3 million YouTube subscribers. And uh, yeah, it was a major turnaround. The major turnaround was hitting rock bottom, giving up, accepting the worst case scenario and being at peace with a totally shitty failed destiny. Yeah. So to sum up, you just gave up trying and and hustling and you just did what felt right and felt best to you and you gave away free value. Yeah. Well, first I was selfish. Like I wasn't giving away free value. I did what felt right to me, which was screw the world. I'm going to lay here on this bench and be a lump. Right. 
I'm yeah. going to be unproductive intentionally. Yeah. I'm going to intentionally be unproductive. But that was the first time, care right? What people think. Yeah, it was the first time because I was trained to be productive. Mm -hmm. I was trained to live by other people's agendas. I was trained to be a productive member of society and do what they say and what they want, to get a job mm -hmm. how they want and make money how they want and do everything on their path and their timeline. And I was like, screw your timeline, screw your path, screw all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a miserable lump for 36 hours. <laughs> yeah. And I did. Yeah. And, and then, then I felt like getting gave the free value though. Well, but then I felt like getting some air conditioning. So I went to the library, but it's all selfish. It was selfish. And this is the trick is like just going out and giving value. If the takeaway that people have from watching is like, I need to go give value, then they're out because it has to be authentic and sincere value that comes as an impulse from your heart. Like I'm so bored, I'm going to sing. And then you become a famous singer, but like you're not singing to give value. You're singing because it was in your heart to do. You have to drop all the shame and judgment and be like, whatever, I don't care. I'm, I want to feel like singing. I'm going to sing for 36 hours. Okay. So the difference between what you say about giving value and like someone like Gary V, he doesn't really ever make it clear. He started giving value selfishly. He right. was bored or he wanted to do something or he was frustrated with his life or something. And he was like, like it came to him. The impulse came to him. I'm going to help my wine company or whatever. He, he didn't just day one start helping the wine company. He yeah. like did a half-assed job or got around or did okay or whatever. But then he was like turning that up. Like, you know what? I'm going to really market the hell out of this wine company or whatever. Like I'm going to start a YouTube channel. Like that inspired idea has to come to you. And he didn't do it. I'm going to start a YouTube channel to serve humanity and serve others. Yeah. Right. This, this I'm going to serve people usually comes from the ego. It usually comes from people who want to look good or who want to get out of their situation or they want to solve the worst case scenario. It's like, no, 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 no. Do what is in your heart, what you love, and it will lead to serving others. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, he doesn't teach this part. That's the missing. The selfish part. That's the missing piece that to do it with a, with a full open heart and, and not doing it because you know that it's going to lead to this. You're just doing it to help and to serve and to love because it feels good to you. Exactly. And so that's, that's why I was making the comparison because I, I followed him for a long time before you and I met and there was a lot of yes, serve people and, and, and make content. And stuff, but that element was missing. So that's why when I found you, I was completely blown away because there were things, not just this particular thing, but you were talking about other things that I had never heard anyone talk about. And so this is one of the big key differences with you and many of the other gurus when they say serve and do what you love and help other people and, and make content they leave out this very juicy piece of information that everybody needs yeah and you can't even do it until you unplug from everyone's agendas yes and none of them tell you to go be homeless or go be on a vision <laughs> quest or go find yourself or go be in nature for for a week or two unplugged from every single person and device until you come up with what's truly in your heart. None of them tell you that, but that's important. Like you need that part or you'll never know what's in your heart and then you can't serve humanity. It's all one big chain reaction. Right. You really have to get selfish and like figure out what makes you happy yourself. Right. Not selfish as in manipulating others, selfish as in finding yourself. And it's it's really rare to find someone who, who knows themselves. So yeah this is this is amazing and one of the things i've learned from you is that i had to do what felt best for me and yes. for me for you it was uh deciding to be homeless and sure. for me it was leaving america leaving my family and and doing what felt right to me which was to come here and learn from you and be with you right then find what works for you and do it and you did yeah. Would you guys do that? Would you be, for you listening, would you give up everyone else's expectations and agendas of you to go and live alone and do your own thing? Whatever it is that you have a burning desire for that you're like, oh, I can't because I have to do this, this, and they do need to do this and that. And would you give up? that bullshit up to follow your heart and to be happy no matter how old you are yeah. i would but well but you got to be willing <laughs> to go to some dark places right yeah. who knows yeah. where it's going to take you that's why people don't do it right it's unfamiliar and scary and who knows where it's going to take me it's like well that's life it's a giant mystery you don't get to know sorry yeah if you need that control and you need to know where the next step is going to take you you're, you're just going to go through the motions, live some boring life that society plotted, you know, get a job, get a promotion, get a career. Well, at least you know where every step led, right? Yeah. Yeah.
Well, thank you. I appreciate you. And thank you for sharing that with us because I know it's not. Um, yeah. Just thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. My turn. My question for you is what challenges would you say made you who you are today and why? Okay. Well, that's a great question. Thank you. Well, the biggest challenge I think for me was definitely my addiction, my overdose as well. I grew up having everything I wanted ever. I'm an only child and my parents are divorced. So my mother worked three jobs so I could go to school with rich kids and and have everything. Uh, And I still had all this self hate and just unhappy person. And I turned to drugs and it was a challenge for me to at the time, I didn't really even realize it that I was choosing what I wanted to do, even if I was going into a dark place, because I alienated my parents and my friends and even my children. I was blessed enough that my parents took care of my kids while I went and spiraled into a dark, deep hole of depression and drugs. Uh, and learning how to get clean without anybody's help, because I've done 12 step programs. And they didn't work for me. And I had an overdose. And a lot of times I talk about the overdose and I don't really admit the truth of that overdose, which was that I overdosed on purpose and I took too many pills on purpose. Uh, It it was not an accident. And I went to Walgreens to take a pregnancy test. And I went into the ladies room and there was only one stall and it was in a Walgreens where it wasn't a lot of foot traffic back there. And the last thing I remember was hitting the side of the stall and I woke up the next day in ICU with breathing tubes down my throat and up my nose and down my throat. And I woke up and pulled it out and everyone came running and I found out later they thought I was going to die. They told my parents and everybody to, to come say goodbye to me because I wasn't going to wake up. Uh, but I did. And when I woke up, I realized that uh, God gave me another chance and it wasn't, I wasn't done. I knew that there, I was meant for something more. So trying to get clean and get my parents to believe me that I really was going to do it and I was serious. I had to pack all my stuff and move to Hungary, which is where my ex-husband is from, to get my shit together. And I landed on my in-laws doorstep and they had never met me a day in their life before. And they welcomed me in and they gave me a lot of love and they helped me get clean. And and it, like, it sounds like, oh, so easy. But if I had known you then, it would have been easier and it would have, my healing process would have been really smooth, but it, it was not uh, smooth for me. It, it looked that way, but it, it wasn't. So I think like getting clean and, and starting my life over because I lost everything. I lost my home. I lost all my material possessions. I had one suitcase when I left and, and that's all I had left in the world. So all those things combined were, were the probably the biggest challenges of my life. And getting my shit together was another thing. And it took a really long time. So even though I was clean from drugs for 10 years when we met, 10 or 11 years when we met, I still had a lot of those drug addict behaviors and I still wasn't, didn't have my shit together. I was full of anxiety and depression. I had six panic attacks a day. And were you on pain meds anyways? I was, I was also on pain meds. Uh, I was diagnosed with, fib- with fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis. And they had me on all these pain meds, even though I was seen by a doctor and monitored very closely because of my history with addiction. Y- your body becomes addicted to that. Regardless, if you take one every day for the rest of your life, your body becomes dependent on this. And I was dependent on that. And so meeting you, I didn't even tell you, like, I didn't even tell them when uh, we met that I was taking all these things and I had these diagnoses. <laughs> and then you asked me to help make you help you with the health health video. So Jay made this amazing health video for his dad. And he was almost done when we met. And he asked me if I would have a look at it and see if there was any edits I would want to make or anything. It's a two hour video. And after watching those two hours and hearing all these people like Wim Hof and yeah, there was an Indian doctor talking about weight loss and your cells and vision, vision, vision 
was on there and so was Naveen Jane. Jane. Naveen Jane was in it. Like all the oh and Dr. Joe Dispenza. Like all these amazing people saying these things that I had never heard about my body and my cells and how I could heal. And after those two hours were over, I watched every second. I went and tossed all my painkillers. And within three days, I was starting to feel like myself again. Those three days I went through withdrawal and and it wasn't the best, but I was super positive. Like I knew that my body was healing. I knew that I had this. I knew I was never going to need that shit ever again. And that was it. Since then, uh, the the most, the only chemicals I put into my body have been Advil. And, uh, and I'd really like to be better with that. But, but still, like I feel clearer and better and healthier since we met. And you look better. Thank you. And and I've lost weight and my wrinkles have gone away and my hair has gotten thicker and darker. And like uh, I healed a serious rash I had all over my face and and my hands and my skin has gotten smoother. I've gotten stronger like physically in in so many ways. And and all of it started with the change of my mindset. And and so like you asked about the challenge and, and yeah, like getting clean and all that stuff was a challenge. But it, uh, like you, I am so glad. Like there were so many amazing things that came from my addiction. Finding personal development, finding you, uh, learning that I have control over myself and, and my life. And sometimes I, I when I think about it, I, I really wish that I had met you sooner. But at the same time, like I really had to live all those years of pain and, and, and suffering so that I could meet you and really be open and receptive to what you were teaching. And there are so many things like the list of the things that you helped me change are unreal. And, and like we would need an hour of a podcast just for those things to, t- to talk about them. But yeah, I think I answered your question. Yeah, Did you I? crushed it. <laughs> good, good. Yay. Great question. Thank you. Okay, so you guys are Rise Nation. You're watching and and you're following us. What are the challenges that you've had in your life? Share them in the comments. I'd love to hear about them, really, so we can have a conversation about it because we're sharing our challenges with y'all, so we'd love to hear from you too. Okay, so moving on to my next question. You have been robbed and jailed and betrayed and abandoned. You've also had a ton of businesses with and without me. How the hell did you get to be so smart and such a positive person, despite all that crap that you have gone through? Nice. Another great question. So I'd say it's three key things. I'm going to break them down for you in order. Okay. But the first one has kind of a caveat because the first one is genetics. Except if you study epigenetics, then y'all know that genetics are changeable. Yes. So it's not that big a deal. And it's definitely not the majority of where any of this stuff comes from. But it does play a role. And it would be wrong of me to act like it doesn't. On top of that, everyone's everyone has some genetic advantages. Right. And it doesn't really matter what your genetic advantages are. It's just up to you to make the best of them, use them, leverage them, because they will help you win in different ways than other people win. So being genetically smart is not better than being genetically strong or being genetically beautiful. They're all useful. So I got you. Okay. So part of my smarts and positivity are probably genetic. I was raised by two quite intelligent parents. My dad was a literal mechanical genius, engineering genius. And my mom had very high EQ, emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And she was very able to navigate social interactions and stuff. And I got the best of both of those worlds. So just pretty good. All right. Yeah. But it wasn't just genetics. A huge part of how I became so smart and positive and smart is a is a thing. Like, I don't know if you say you're smart, then you're not. And, <laughs> you know, it's cocky and arrogant. Like when I was a kid, I was a real asshole about this stuff. But I mean, I think people hang on listening knows like you know your shit and you're super smart man like i don't think that's yeah being I mean, cocky, but yeah either way i'm just going off your question and it's okay. the short form anyways mom raised me on flashcards super early like before i could speak and stuff 
Nice. So she's she's instilling more intelligence early. And my dad would test us on our on our smarts. We would he would play chess with us again, practically before I was speaking, you know, like he's letting me knock the pieces around and stuff. Right. Just so I could get a strategic mind and so I could understand logic and I could understand how to use my resources and win with what I have and stuff like that. On top of that, my uncle had a collection of 2000 DVDs or something, 2000 videotapes and DVDs. At first it was VHS and then it was DVDs. <laughs> VHS. <laughs> and he always brought over comics. So he kept a steady stream of media coming into the house. We always had more media than anyone else in the neighborhood. And having that much media exposes you to a lot of stories. And stories are teachers. You can learn a lot from stories. If you just see one story, like Die Hard or something, then you learn that Bruce Willis becomes a hero and defeats the bad guy and it's good to be violent or something. But if you see every movie Hollywood's ever made, you get a very different picture of life. Yeah. And then if you see all the underground indie films, you get an even different picture of life. And then if you see British comedies and, and European films and Faulty Towers and Monty Python and Black Adder and stuff, you, you become sharper verbally and you get more sarcastic and you can appreciate higher forms of humor and stuff mm -hmm. like this. And so all this media was like fuel for me to learn. Like I could learn a lot from that. Plus, I was given the logic from my dad and the emotional maturity and the boost from my mom and they were teaching me early and they made sure that we always went to church and that I was always using my gifts to help the world and be positive. I was taught to be loving mm -hmm. as unconditionally loving as possible. I was taught that Jesus is the ultimate role model and we should all aspire to be like him. And we should all be aiming to follow like him and mm -hmm. walk in his footsteps and do what he would do were he around today and that kind of thing. And so this combination of traits sort of raised me to be reasonably intelligent and reasonably positive. On top of that, it made me a ton of friends. It wasn't the healthiest way to make friends. I was basically pimping out my skills in trade for, for friendship, but I was popular with every like click in the school. Right. The jocks love me. The music hall kids love me. The gifted classes love me. The general classes love me. The gamers loved me. The girls loved me. Like I was super popular with all the ladies, not in like I'm special way or whatever. I just happened to know how to be sort of a social chameleon. I, mm -hmm. I knew how to appeal to other people and to use my savvy to navigate those situations and always come out looking good and always keeping my friends around. It was super unhealthy. It was super manipulative. It wasn't good, but it was me practicing my abilities. I was still using the gifts I, I had and I was using them effectively, maybe not healthily, but it was practice. And so I got practice. And the third reason I'm like this is focus, practice and focus. And this is the most powerful one, I would say. Yes. Far more powerful than how you were raised or what your parents did. Far more powerful than your particular genetic advantages or disadvantages is practice and focus. Because you can find people from all walks of life with all kinds of obstacles and hindrances and disadvantages. And with practice and focus, they overcome all of them. And it's impressive and it's stunning every time someone does it, but it's actually not that rare. It's super common. Anytime anyone succeeded in anything, you go look at their story, it involved a ton of practice and focus. Yes. And the practice and focus obliterated everything else. Yeah. So I probably could have just <laughs> led with that, but I wanted to give credit where credit's due. Sure. And you could give me anyone, someone with major disadvantages, intellectual deficiencies or neurodivergent people or whatever mm -hmm. you call it. And and then we're back to isolation. If they're unplugged <laughs> from everybody else's agenda mm -hmm. and they go off to a studio or a cabin in, or cottage in the woods or something and they sit down and focus and practice obsessively on whatever they're passionate about, they will emerge a genius in that subject. Yeah. And so me being smart or me being positive isn't all that special. It's really not that difficult. Anyone can become that with, with enough practice and focus. Now, not everyone is destined to become that. Right. Other people are meant to be practicing and focusing on becoming a great basketball player. Right. And they end up a great basketball player who's of average intelligence and kind of a dick. But, but they focused and practiced and obsessively became what they're supposed to be, a great basketball player. And they will be a genius in that area. I practice my thing and I'm, I become a genius in that area. You practice your thing and you become a genius in that area. And the, the only people who don't become a genius in any area are the people who neglect practice and focus. There you go. There you go. So Rise Nation, what are you practicing and focusing on? What skills are you really giving your time and attention to and really learning and honing in on so that you can be that? Yeah. And like I said before, you can only do it when you take some isolation time and get clear on your true heart and hear that inner voice. Because what you might want to practice and focus is like 
gaming. You might become a gaming tutorial content creator, or you might become an esports pro, or you might become a coach. I don't know, but most people are too scared to practice and focus gaming. So how are you going to become the genius of your destiny if you can't even practice and focus on the thing that your heart's calling you towards, right? right. So you really have to go find that out first. Right. Because significant practice and focus is really only sustainable through the passion of your heart. If you try to sustain mm -hmm. significant practice and focus at something you're not supposed to be doing or meant to be doing or that's not in your heart's calling, you won't be able to keep it up. I mean, it's awesome. It really is. You, you get such amazing perspective and insight. I'm serious. Like, this is why you guys need to buy our book, like Eyes Wide Open Volume 1, because you're going to get this Whenever you want on your coffee table, it looks beautiful. It's stunning. And not just that, why wouldn't you want to learn from this man? I mean, like, I'm so glad that we decided to start this podcast because now I don't feel the breedy that I'm hiding everything and holding all this amazing, wonderful, juicy goodness to myself. And I'm happy to share it with you, with, with you. And thank you for sharing it with me. And if you want to talk to Jay one-on-one -on -one about your own situation, whatever it is, shoot me an email, leave it in the comments, and I'm happy to set that up and we can talk about it. And man, we could not have come from two totally different backgrounds. Like we are, we, we have a lot in common now, but like <laughs> we grew up completely different. And, but I love that. I love that about us. My turn again. Your question is, what are the differences and similarities between you and your parents? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Really, I don't think anyone's ever asked that before. Well, let's see. As far as my mom is concerned, um, the differences are I don't worry the way she does. I, I used to, but since meeting you, you've taught me worrying is, is pointless and they're just stories that I'm making up in my head that won't come true. She put a lot of fears onto me that I've let go of. I was a germ phobe for a long time and had some issues with, I guess, OCD stuff that I, I no longer have. One of the things I'm similar to her is, is I love music and she's she was a musician. She's not anymore, but she loves classical music and she played the flute and the piano and she grew up in a musical family. And even though when I was growing up, there wasn't a lot of music, when I discovered it, I became obsessed. And so even though I don't play an instrument, I'm one of only a few of us in my family that don't. I have a really good ear for music and, and I, as you know, I'm obsessed and I love it. So that is actually similar to both of my parents. Both of them love music and I'm a, I'm a really good nurturer, like my mom. My mom loves to nurture people. And even if she doesn't do it in the most obvious way, sometimes that part of her, she can't help. Like when I come home, she wants, she'll make my food, even though I don't, if I don't ask her to, she wants to take care of me and help me with money and laundry. And uh, so she's very much a natural nurturer and, and uh, very motherly. So I, I have that also. Oh, and, and I also like both, well, not my dad, but my mom. Uh, I enjoy helping people find solutions. And my mom, one of the things she's taught me is there's always a solution. The only thing you can't solve are taxes and death. <laughs> that's that's our motto. Everything has a solution. And, and I feel the exact same way. I do aim to be more solution-based than, than problem-based. And I've learned also for me to kind of be better about this. That's such a good question, really. And... I think I'm a lot like my dad that I, I I don't want to burden other people with my feelings. And and this is not necessarily a good thing. And, and this is issues that we've had in the past. But my mother has no problem expressing herself and how she feels. But my dad does. And, and I learned I learn that probably from him. I have that in common with him. And um, also that he's the kind of person that if you tell him something, he will take it to the grave. He will not tell anyone or gossip about it. And I'm similar in that respect. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, think, I think that's it, really, that I can think of off the top of my head. That's great. Yeah. So, Rise Nation, what about you? What are some similarities and differences and traits in your parents that have helped you or hindered you from the life that you want? Okay, my turn again. <laughs> So you're an artist, 
like me and you're super creative like me too. And you have lots of businesses like I mentioned earlier. You helped Evan go from a thousand subscribers to three million on YouTube. You helped his brand go from boring and bland to um, the amazing Believe Nation brand that he has today. I mean, no offense, but it's true. It's, it's true. So what did you do to help him? And and how did you know how to do those things? Because when you guys met, you were homeless and you hadn't built that for yourself yet. So how did you know and what did you do? Another good question. I can't even tell you how many things and what I did over the decade plus we collaborated, right? Mm -hmm. Like I helped him make a clothing line. I helped him create the believe gesture, come up with taglines and slogans for his various endeavors. Mm -hmm. Helped him branch out, tweak his Instagram here, grow his Instagram there, grow his YouTube here, work on the thumbnails, polish the thumbnails, change the branding, settle on fonts, choose color schemes, coach his team, coach his staff, help them get better. I, I can't even, I could not possibly sum up everything I did with and for that man. Uh, you did the graphics in his book too? Yeah, I did the graphics for everything. Landing pages, websites. We redid the site. We did the author site. We did the, the YouTube covers, everything. I helped him get professional headshots. I taught him that images are currency. Photos are currency if you're going to be a celebrity or an influencer. All kinds of stuff. Just insane, insane amounts of stuff. As for how I can do that, it's partly what we talked about before because I have a, a quick mind and I can learn and teach quickly and I'm fairly positive and solution focused. But you mentioned being an artist, a creative artist, and I'm, I'm fairly good at many art forms. This feels like I'm bragging in this in this thing but i don't get to talk about my own skills that often and yeah. there, there's kind of a lot and i asked yeah but anyways most great artists can tell when a piece they're working on is off yeah or something's missing or something needs to be added mm -hmm. to make it right, right or to to make it a masterpiece mm -hmm. and i feel like i have that knack for life like as an artist of life or an artist of personalities or an artist of people or interactions or something I don't think we have that as a discipline, an artist of interactions, of people, maybe. But anytime I'm looking at anything, a brand, a business, a marketing campaign, someone's communication style or conversation, their word choice, some interactions, no matter what it is, I can tell if something's off and if something's missing or needs to be added to make it really sing. You're so good at that. You really are. Thank you. And I can zero in on it. Like I could like, you know, pat your shoulder and I can tell if there's like a tumor there or like a mole or if anything's yeah, you find touched up or whatever. A flaw. Kind and, of. and I do quotes because uh I don't it, see it as a flaw. Right. And you see it as as the It thing. just exists. Yeah. Yes. Like it like the way an artist sees like a cloud is painted wrong or something, or it needs a, a, a touch of white. Mm -hmm. I don't think the artist looks at the painting and is like, that's terrible. How dare that be there? That's a flaw I have to fix. I think they just think, you know, I think a, a splash of white could really bring this, bring this home. Well, and this... that's the vibe I have when I'm doing this, when I'm using this ability. Well, that's why you're Jay Rise. Yeah. Because you can rise anyone in anything. Exactly. And that's what I told everyone from the beginning. That's what I told Evan. I can rise anyone and anything. And anytime he's introduced me to anyone, I've done exactly that. Mm -hmm. And so to me, this is the trick. This is the key. This is the superpower. This is why I can teach anything to anyone or improve anything that's given to me or uh, really help people rise up mm -hmm. quickly. The thing is, this is an awesome superpower to have, but since it almost feels like flaw hunting and people are very sensitive to flaws being pointed out mm -hmm. for me to shine and to really help someone i need someone with no ego who's really open-hearted and open-minded and who's just like change me i need a blank canvas or a cooperative canvas anyways right one that's not going to fight back when i go to make a, a little splash of white on the cloud yeah right yes I don't know uh, how many people out there are like that, but it's my job and my mission to find the people who are like that and to reach them and to touch them and to help them change because I am a change agent. I can help you change everything about yourself fast. Yes. And the beauty of collaborating with Evan is he didn't care. He was like, just give me the hard feedback. Give me the harsh truths. Tell me every freaking flaw you can find and we'll fix it together. I don't care about the work. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care if we have to delay it for five years, but it, I'll put it on the list. I appreciate your help and, and I will rise it up. And he was willing to rise. Yeah. And so this is heaven to me. Anyone who's resisting or fighting or defending, 
and and who bristles when I use my my little knack is pain to me. I can't like I'm like then I can't be myself. It's like being a good singer, but the audience doesn't want to hear it. Or being a painter, the audience just walks by or doesn't want to see it. If if you're a good improver of people, improver of interactions, improver of things, and people don't want to be improved and they're like, eh, I don't like this. That's terrible. Right. It's soul crushing. I don't want to live like this. What, what's the point of having the superpower if no one wants to be changed and no one wants to be improved and no one wants their life to rise up? No one wants to like uh, have the truth told to them. No one wants their, their stuff pointed out, right? Right. And at the same time, in reverse, anyone can point out anything about me and it doesn't matter because I understand. Like, I want to point out these things for others if they would let me and so if someone's going to point it out to me it's fine like i get it especially if i'm asking for it like if it's solicited so you know if people in the comments like oh he's four eyes coke bottle glasses his teeth are open up uh you know he's he's way too skinny or way too whatever right like he says like too many times and um too many times <laughs> yeah i get it i get it these are all things i could work on and i don't take any of it personally and i will work on these things like i already spotted them on my own i'm good at, i'm good at spotting this stuff and it doesn't bother me uh no. you've said some extremely yes. interesting things to me and uh every time I'm, it just rolls like off my back water off a duck's back because how else are we going to improve unless someone around us tells us what's up? And so usually I'm just like, are you serious? Is that correct? Is that true? Is this, do you mean this? Because if it is, I, I can work on it. Yeah. You told me I was too short once, so I grew. That's not what I said. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> you don't have to sure it. Know, and that's the whole I know. thing. No, no. But they another... don't know what the conversation was. But this is another problem. Yeah. If I want to summarize a flaw, yo, you're too skinny. Yo, you're too short. I don't want to have to sugarcoat it and dance around someone's feelings. Like they're making my job real hard. Yes. Well, you know, I've noticed that in your industry, majority of the players are approximately six feet. And I don't, I'm not saying anything. Like, of course, you're fine how you are. But if we're just looking at people, is there anything you notice about, like, I don't want to take 20 hours to point out the thing Agreed. and let's fix Agreed. it. Can't we just be like, you're shorter than all the other influencers. Let's either use this as a strength or or change it. Yes. Like own this in your marketing yes. or grow. Yes. But this is what I'm saying. I, I want to summarize our conversation. Like you said I was too short. I grew. It's a good story. This makes the point. And you're like, well, you know, let's just get picky <laughs> with the details and let's get no, precious I with know. the words. Uh, I, I, you see what I'm saying? Yes, I, I have this ability. And the reason I was able to help Evan so much, so fast for so long is because he, he had no problem just getting straight to the point, yeah. admitting the flaw or whatever needs changed. And let's, let's, let's crush it together. And then I'm giving him research and I'm showing him how to change it. And I'm finding staff to change it. And I'm, I'm finding efficient deals on how to change it and cost effective ways to change it. And it's like, we can move on to all the solutions if we could just admit the thing first. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it did. And actually that's one of the things I love about you is, is that tough love. And I don't even really see it as tough love, but it's the best way to describe it for other people to understand what I mean. When we first met, it was like getting slapped in the face, but I welcomed it because I had been, I had spent my whole life being fed candy coated lies. I was over it. So to hear you being honest with me was refreshing and amazing. And still to this day, there are times still where you'll say stuff and I feel like, like that hurt. Yeah, just recently. But I, yes, but I, I'm used to it and I, I welcome it and I never, ever want you to stop, even if it's not my favorite in the moment, even if I get emotional about it in the moment, I will always choose it every single time because I spent many years with other people in my life who didn't, don't have the balls, even to this day, to say how they really, truly feel to me. Yeah, real talk, yo. And if they do, they do it in a hateful, mean way. And you never do. Nope. It's it's always you know from a loving, kind place of wanting to help me grow and be a better person. Yeah, like an artist wanting to create a masterpiece. Yeah, let's create a masterpiece. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's my vibe. I know. You know, we could work on this next. Don't have to. Yes. But yes. we could work on this or this or this. Yes. It'll be amazing. Right. You'll live a great life. I'm I'm so grateful. And and for those of you out there who don't have someone like that in your life, I highly recommend that you get to know Jay more and, and learn from him because it's really refreshing to have somebody be honest with you and tell you your shit, even if it hurts. I mean, it, it hurts in the beginning. It hurts that first moment. But so what? Okay. It hurt. Big deal. Now let's fix it. That's it. So... 
thank you. Thank you for being like that. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate you. I love you. And I hope you never change that. Rise Nation, what about you? Are What candy-coated lies are you telling yourself and others are telling you that you need and want to hear the truth of? Please share with us in the comments or email me. I'll give you the truth. <laughs> My last turn, Sin. What changes would you like to see for the future of humanity? <laughs> That's a really good question. I ask good questions. You do. <laughs> um, honestly, uh, I'd really like to see humanity pay attention to you more. Uh, and, and I don't mean that like from a marketing standpoint or, or selling anything. I mean it because you helped me change my life. I went from depressed and fat. Like I'm still fat, but I lost a hundred pounds, you know, and I had panic attacks. I hated myself. I hated my life. I had no purpose. I was lost. I felt like my goal, any goal I had was super far away. Didn't know I had to set real goals. Didn't understand obligation. Didn't understand positivity, love. Love, sex, life, kink, shame, the list goes on and on. I didn't understand any of that stuff. And meeting you changed my entire life. Like the, the people who knew me before, I'm not close to any of them because they don't like who I've become because I hold up a mirror for who they are now. And, and that's fine with me because I'm closer to who I really want to be because meeting you. And if more people out there did that, if they learned from you and, and did the things and took your suggestions and took steps and did the, all the things to change your life, even one thing that you're teaching, they would be so much happier, so much happier. And, and you changed my life and made me a happy person. You didn't make me happy. You taught me how to be happy because I, I always want to make that point is that you didn't do anything except be yourself and, and answer questions and do the things we're, we do on the podcast. And you taught me that there were other perspectives. There were other ways. There was the third way that I always thought life was black and white and it's shades of gray. There's always a solution and always multiple solutions. Change is amazing. And, and I want people to embrace change because a lot of us feel stuck and scared of change. And I, I love it now. And I didn't always. I loved my comfort zone. I thought the comfort zone meant I was safe. But actually, it didn't mean I was, I was not safe. I was on the highway to being miserable and having regrets and hating myself and dying young, dying early. And now every day I wake up, I'm grateful for my life. I'm grateful to wake up next to you. I'm grateful for what we're building. I'm grateful for our friendship, our relationship, our partnership in every way, shape and form that it, that it takes and that it will in the future. And I would love to see humanity genuinely pay attention to you. And and so one of the reasons, like I said before, I started the, we started the podcast is because I felt greedy for having all this goodness to myself. And wanting to share it with the world isn't for my personal gain. It's because I felt I had so much pain and, and hate and anger. And I don't think anyone should live like that. And, it, and it's not fair uh, that people think that that's okay because there's so much more out there. And, and so I really, really want, and my passion is to help all those people who feel lost and confused and alone uh, and for them to know that there's other ways to feel better. And it's not hard. It really isn't. It's just to make that decision. So yeah, hope I answered your question. Yeah, it was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for helping me change my life. I'm so brave. I love you. Aw. You're the best. <laughs> You're the best. Okay. So <laughs> now that I've dried my tears, we're almost at the end. <laughs> I decided to do a bonus, a lightning round of just giving you a few facts about Jay. Okay. <laughs> Jay can play any League of Legend champion there is. Literally, he can pick it up and play it and crush you. He says he's not an expert, but I would put him in a game with the pros and I know he would hang. He's literally taken on 
four of us, me and my son and our other two friends against him. And we lost. <laughs> you are next level at that game. And it's not just that game. It's, it's other games too. Uh, he's a speed reader, has a photographic memory and an actual genius you know the full photographic memory it's really great when i forget things but it's also really shitty when i forget things too <laughs> little fun fact when i was young i wanted to have a photographic memory so bad i thought that was the coolest thing ever you are super well versed in all things pop culture so i spent 15 years with a man who anytime i made a pop culture reference he had no idea what i was talking about because he grew up in europe and you like i say the most random offhanded things from any cartoon music lyric uh movie tv show and you know every time i love that about you <laughs> you can rap Godzilla by Eminem. And I can it, swallow a bottle of alcohol and be like Godzilla. Uh, and you do it pretty fast. It's it's pretty impressive. And your vocal range is amazing. It's super impressive what you can do with your voice. It's really cool. Like you can imitate almost anybody. I've been driving around <laughs> town with the girl I love. Fuck you. <laughs> I can't even go that high. I love that. Words like violence break the silence. Come crashing in into my little world. Oh my god. That's awesome. Thank you. Oh my god. You are super sweet and you make anyone around you feel special. We did a podcast last night and the, the guy said, I'm not gay, but I love Jay. <laughs> And you do, you always make everyone feel so special and you are a really, really kind and loving human being. And uh, I think that's a side, maybe not everyone notices, but they should. Well, I was raised to have Jesus as my role model. Yeah, well. <laughs> Gotta at least make an effort. Yeah, well, you, you do a great job and you always make me feel loved and cared for. The last one is that you have never judged me for any of the shit I've ever told you. I have told you some stuff I've never shared with anyone and you have never judged me for my past, my present, and I've never heard you judge anyone else either. You are a super non-judgmental person and, and that's oh, such a loving thing. So thank you. Judge not lest ye be judged in our society. I think judgment is super common and I should confess that as a kid, as a teenager, I was the most judgy person. I was terrible mm -hmm. and it repulsed and pushed everyone away i lost a lot of friends because of it and it serves me right but it also taught me to be the opposite because you learned that hard lesson yeah i'm never doing that again yeah thank you all right six rapid fire facts about sin one she's a walking hallmark store i mean she can craft or diy just about anything but she has a special knack for creating cards and special occasions every time she makes a card i'm just like what you could have bought this at any store for seven bucks it's beautiful it's personalized it's flawless it's so well done mm. two she inspired me to start a kink company and ran it for like a year you can see one of the t-shirts from it it was a kink clothing line and she started the slay shame movement which really caught on in the kink community no shame slay shame yeah. people loved it and you can still find a lot of the content the memes the shirt designs over at at rise kink on instagram Three, she's traveled quite a bit and lived in many different places. Hungary, Ireland, Florida, New York, Toronto, Ohio, mm -hmm. to name a few. Four, she's a natural born swimmer. She started learning as a baby. She was competitive. She's back at it again. That's how she's losing a lot of the weight. Mm -hmm. And we call her the mermaid. <laughs> Five, she could probably beat you at friends trivia. <laughs> yes. Anyways... <laughs> Last but not least, I mean, you're probably wondering, but her cup size varies between <laughs> F and double G. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And that is why our podcast and book is called Eyes Wide Open. Keep, Keep rising. rising. <laughs>